So we are entering James chapter 4. Tonight we're going to, tonight, today, we're going to look at (laughs) verses 1 through 10. And we are entering the peacemaking phase of the book of James. Uh, And he starts off by by taking us uh, right from the get-go into a kind of rather non-peacemaking issue. So we're going to jump right into this here. Starting in verse 1. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? So James now turns his attention to infighting within the church. A place where, as Christians, we should be safe. A place where Christ's love should abound. But if I go back and look at my own personal history, some of the greatest hurts and pains have come from within the church. Um, the reality is, we are just we are so we are so human within the church too. There's hurt and betrayal. We react to an insensitive word or an unthinking word here or there, and these quarrels that build up among us at times, they hurt. They hurt us spiritually. They hurt us physically at times. The non-believer sees this and is singed by it by association, shall we say, and then the new believer and the new faith can be crushed by it. Within the church body, grace should flow. We should be living out 1 Corinthians 13, which is where we're going to go here. 1 Corinthians 13 is the love chapter, often referred to, and you know, you see it in, at weddings and on the walls, but it's not talking about romantic love, though you can surely place it in that category. This is how we are to love each other. So starting in verse 4 here, a reminder for all of us, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Um, Oh, and then I kind of cut off. Jesus loves us like that. He is patient and kind. He bears all things. He bore it all for us. And we are to love each other like that. We need to remember in our roles as peacemakers that our fellow Christians are just as human today as they were before they were Christians. And we, me, I am just as human We make mistakes. We need to have thick skin. Let the offenses roll off. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 11 says, Finally, brothers, rejoice, aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. The reality is each of us battles every day our flesh. It's still very much a part of us. And manifest in different ways as we go about our days and how we interact with people. But we need to be, day by day, being transformed by God, by Jesus. Romans 12.2 says, Do not be conformed of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So again, we need to remember that we're human. The personalities are going to clash. There, were, there are times where, yeah, we're going to fight over some petty things. But it's not worth fighting over. There are points, and there are come times, when there are things worth fighting over in the church. The Word of God would be one of them. The truth of the Word of God. Standing firm in our belief in the Word of God. But most of the rest of the stuff not really worth fighting over. Um, This is just some kind of lame examples here, but, you know, the color of the walls, the chairs don't match this. That's just surface stuff. Um, 
are there physical issues that need to be taken care of at times within the, ch- within the physical church building? Yes. Do they need to be brought to attention? Yes. But then we need to be able to move on and move past it and, go, and move forward um, with what we're really doing here. Um, so this kind of brings us into verse 2 here. You de- James, verse 2 says, You desire and do not have, so you murder. Oof. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. So I'm going to take this in a little bit of a shift from the direction our book went. Um, and I, th- we're going to talk about jealousy t- over um, spiritual gifts. We can covet and desire all kinds of things in this world, but specifically within the church, we're going to look in this, at this point with jealousy that can occur because of the desire to have a spiritual gift that somebody else has. What does that mean? Um, maybe... You're jealous. I'm not. I can probably look at my life and think that, yes, some of these things have applied to me at various times. I'm jealous over someone's amazing ability to speak um, or lead worship. I don't play any instruments, at least not very well. I don't necessarily sing very well, but I really sometimes wish I did. Um, or even being um, jealous over a, um, another person's ability to be a really great prayer warrior or support for someone. I know I've been guilty of this. And this kind of stuff creeps up within people. We're, you know, here we are, we're in our, in our comfortable Christian environment, and we see how this person is prospering with this particular gifting or this gifting, and we want to be part of that too. And it, it starts to gnaw on us because maybe we don't have that ability. The, the word of caution that comes to mind whenever I get like that is with gifts, with these gifts, come great responsibility. Whether it's teaching or worship or being that support for someone, um, there's great responsibility that comes with the gifts that God gives us. Um, three verses, in particular, um, all the Gospels kind of address, particularly to teaching, but Matthew 18.6, Mark 9.42, and Luke 17.2 all kind of address the same issue. I'm going to read Mark 9.42. It says, um, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. That is the burden of leadership, of those who are in, um, in leadership roles, in spiritual roles, uh, le- um, with other people. Of other people. In fact, when you look in the book of Titus, it looks at the roles of um, overseer, elder, bishop, depending on which version you're looking at, um, that are guardians, spiritual guardians, deacons who are servants. And you see that both these groups of people are held to a fairly strict standard um, in, in their personal lives, not just in how they act as they act with fellow Christians in that church environment, but in their own personal lives, the standards are pretty, are pretty high. And the reality is that brings us to not all of us are called to be in those roles. Not all of us are worship leaders. Not all of us are necessarily prayer warriors. Not all of us are, are put into those roles. God has different roles for each of us. And this leads us to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 18. And I have this in the New Living Translation. It was the way I copied it, but it's really clear in how the many parts of the body that we are. So starting in verse 18, but our bodies have, our body, bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it only had one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. And the parts we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with the greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen, while the more honorable parts do not require the special care. So God has put the body together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. This makes for harmony among the members so that all the members care for each other, If one part suffers, all parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all parts are glad. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is part of it. Here are some of the parts God has appointed for the church. First are apostles, 
second are prophets, third are teachers, and then those who do miracles, those who have the gift of healing, and those who can help others, those who have the gift of leadership, those who speak in unknown languages. Are we all apostles? Are we all prophets? Are we all teachers? Do we all have the power to do miracles? Do we all have the gift of healing? Do we all have the ability to speak in unknown languages? Definitely not me. Do we all have the ability to interpret unknown languages? Of course not. So you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts, but no, now let me show you the way of life that is best for all. I actually am amazed at how this all flowed together because the very next chapter is 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. We all have different roles within the body and they are each unique and specific and special and something that God has for each of us. But more importantly than that, the way of life is the how we are to love each other. The final part of verse 2 does speak to something, though. It says, um, it, it speaks to the not asking part. And I go back to that verse. Um, you do not have because you do not ask. God does not withhold that which he would have us be tooled with, shall we say, to be about. He desires to bless us. He desires to, to arm us with what we need and equip us for what he would have us be about. Psalms 84, 11, and I just realized this is in the King James Version that I have. Let me read this one. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold for those who walk uprightly. He has good plans for you, and in that he will equip you for those plans that he is about. But there is an asking that comes with it. We need to be willing to ask. And there's a certain sense of maturity that goes with that. So asking under itself is a fairly simple concept. We all should understand this. Uh, my kids get it really well. We go to a store and they ask, Mama, can I have this? Mama, can I have that? They're really good at asking. And they usually say no. But um, somehow when we get into adulthood, though, that something disconnects there. We don't like to ask anymore, whether it's people or God, for that matter. And this um, came really prominent in my life just this last week because that's what happens when I'm doing, preparing for these studies. God uses these studies amazingly in my own life. And I got into an argument with my husband over some things he wasn't doing around the house. I was so mad. I was overwhelmed, actually. It was a, yeah. I had grumbled, I had mumbled, but I never actually said anything. And he pointed out towards the end of this argument very clearly that he, I'd never asked him. I'd never pointed out any of this stuff to him. I'd never spoken up. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean now that I point it all out to him and ask him everything, that he's suddenly going to do it all. But the point is asking, making that connection. And that's part of that, I believe, with God as well. Asking. It shows where your heart is, where your desire is, that you want to be about the, thing, about the things of God. We just need to be prepared that he might not necessarily say yes. He might say no. He might say wait. But that asking shows a certain level of dependence, too, on God. So let's go to the next part of this. In verse 3, it says, You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Okay, so now we've flipped the coin from not asking at all to now asking for all the wrong reasons. So if I take this back to, if we're looking mostly at spiritual gifts in this sense of what I'm talking about today, so why do you want a certain spiritual gift? I already talked about kind of the standards that people are held to with their different gifts. Um, but why is it you want it? Do you want it for the notoriety, for the accolades, for the perceived power, or whatever that is, for the, you know, everyone will be like, oh, you sing so well. This is not a slight on worship leaders. But um, that's all the wrong reasons to be asking for any sort of spiritual gift. We need to not be afraid to ask, but we need to recognize if we're, we need to be 
concerned that we are asking for the right reasons? Is it for the furthering the kingdom of God? Is it being in his will? Are we prepared for him to say no? Verse 4, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture said he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? God wants to be your one and only obsession. And if he's your obsession, your prayers, your requests will align with his will. God will satisfy you with the gifts that he gives you. Things of this world, they are appealing, yes, but they fail. They will never satisfy. You will be stuck in a continuous loop. You'll never get to that final point. Once again, another example that hit me in the face this past week, um, a really basic example how the world fails. Um, I have been reading this series of books over the past few years, all linked together. Each book could kind of stand on its own, but um, the series all linked together, and it was leading towards some grand conclusion, and I read the last book in the series, and I went, wait a minute. It didn't answer, it didn't conclude. Turns out the author is doing a whole other series that be begins before the beginning of the original series and will carry on past the end of that series, and now I've got to wait on that. The point being is, there's never a conclusion. There's no ending. There's no satisfaction with that. That is so like the world. That is the lure of the world and the way of the world. You always got to buy the newest thing, right? The iPhone's outdated as soon as it comes out sort of deal. So th that's the reality. God wants to be our obsession. We should not be obsessed with the things or how the world even um, judges, like, the things. <laughs> so now we're going we're gonna to move here. James is going to take us. He's pointed out what's going wrong within the church. Now we're going to fix it. Verse 6 says, um, But he gives more grace. Therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Verse 7, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee for you. When we are submitted to God, the quarreling, the bickering, the the little nitty-gritty stuff begins to fade, and we can, we can be in that right place. Uh, David Guzak via Spurgeon brought out, uh, had, so, yeah, has this list um, of why we should submit to God. We should submit to God because he created us. We should submit to God because his rule is good for us. We should submit to God because all resistance in him is futile. We should submit to God because such submission is absolutely necessary to salvation. We should submit to God because it is the only way to have peace with God. All of us took that first submissive step when we came to Christ. Submission, submission submit, that's a word we don't necessarily like. You know, it's like we're giving up something, but that is absolutely necessary for this. It's what's brought us to salvation. It's what's necessary day by day. And it's very freeing when we are submitted to God and his will and his plan for our lives. Verse 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Verse 9, be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. James tells us to draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. It's not like an opposing magnet where you're constantly being pushed away. Instead, it's like a magnet. It's drawing you closer. But it's easy to say that. Draw near to God. That's all you need to do. Draw near to God. But what does that even look like? Um, so again, thank you, David Guzak via Spurgeon. We have another list here. It says, and so what does it mean to draw near to God? It means to draw near in worship, praise, and in prayer. It means to draw near by asking counsel of God, you know, asking, seeking. It means to draw near in enjoying communion with God. And it means to draw near in the general course and tenor of your life. 
It is indeed a day by day, hour by hour, moment by moment, drawing near to God. Even if it's just a simple song, you can draw closer to God in any point of your day. Verse 10 says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Come, humbling yourselves before God means going to him first, really. Instead of trying to do it on your own, trying to go to someone else to solve your problem, do you go to God first? Um, there is no problem so small that God doesn't want you to bring it to him. No problem so small that God doesn't want you to bring it to him. And that's humbling to think about. I'm like, I can do it. I can fix this little problem right here. But reality is God wants to be your obsession. He wants to help you with the little stuff as well as the big stuff. That's humbleness. Uh, David, a quote from David Guzak um, here. It says, as we, come, as we come as sinners before the holy God, not as self-righteous religionists, as Jesus explained, we appropriately humble ourselves before God. Then he will lift us up because God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble and grace, the unmerited favor of God, always lifts us up. When we're humble before God, we'll be in the right alignment as well. We'll be allowing him to work in our lives. Our prayers will be in alignment with his will. And we can be the peacemakers that he would have us be. We need to remember, as a whole, to speak softly and have thick skin. Don't assume someone's out to get you, I guess. Based off a couple weeks ago, we need to temper our words with the love of Christ and draw near to God day by day that we can have that connection, that we can be praying in his will, asking him for those things, and drawing near. That's what I've got. I'm going to close in prayer. <laughs> Father God, thank you again for this time. And Lord, um, I just ask that for everyone here, for everyone who hears this, Father, that you would bring to us throughout the day those moments where we can draw near to you, whether it's a simple verse, a song, or a word from a friend, Father, that we would draw ever so close to you, indeed moment by moment, Lord that we would be in your will um, and that indeed we would not be given to the world um, looking for satisfaction in that sense, Lord, but we would be obsessed with you in all that we are about, Father. In your name we pray, amen. <laughs>